This is Richard Knight, President of the American Association of Kidney Patients, coming to you from Maryland for this year's Are You OK? virtual educational event, recognizing National High Potassium Awareness Day. On behalf of the AAKP, it is my pleasure to kick us off. AAKP is the largest and fully independent patient-led kidney patient organization in the nation. Since 1969, AAKP has been driving policy discussions on kidney patient consumer care choice and treatment innovation. Our mission is to improve the lives and long-term outcomes of all kidney patients through education, advocacy, patient engagement, and the fostering of patient communities. This Awareness Day was founded by the AAKP to bring the important topic of high potassium, also known as hyperkalemia, to the forefront of kidney patients' minds. Since 2020, AAKP has been educating millions of people about the risk of hyperkalemia and the availability of innovative treatments to prevent this most devastating impact of this condition. For this year's awareness campaign, AAKP continued to expand our reach and educational resources so kidney patients, their medical teams, and our friends and allies across the kidney community can support this national grassroots movement to continue to mark May 1st, 5.1, as National High Potassium Awareness Day. As a kidney patient myself, spending a few notable years on dialysis and now 15 years out on my kidney transplant, I've learned the importance of knowing and more importantly, understanding my lab values and following a kidney friendly diet that's right for me. This Awareness Day is meant to help you gain more knowledge so that you can feel empowered to properly manage your potassium intake. Throughout this virtual event, You'll hear from a number of speakers, including healthcare professionals and patients who will share their stories, tips, and expertise with us. My friends, please sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And of course, take some notes so you can put what you learned today into action tomorrow. And now, I'd like to introduce Diana Kleins, the Executive Director of AAKP, to share a few words. Diana, take it away. Thank you, Richard. And I'd like to echo his warm welcome. Thank you all for joining us today for National High Potassium Awareness Day. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our Are You OK campaign and virtual event sponsors, B4 Pharma, founding sponsor since 2020, and AstraZeneca, supporting sponsor. It is estimated that nearly 3 million individuals with chronic kidney disease and or heart disease suffer from high potassium. This sobering number was a catalyst for the AAKP to develop our Are You OK campaign and mark May 1st as National High Potassium Awareness Day. This campaign utilizes the scientific symbol for potassium with a popular message, are you okay, to encourage individuals with kidney diseases to know their potassium levels. The safe range for blood potassium level is commonly considered under 5.1. Levels of 5.1 or higher may indicate hyperkalemia, making May 1st, 5.1, the key time for this annual awareness day. As you watch today's program, I hope you will learn from the patient and healthcare speakers and gather as many takeaways as possible regarding the importance of managing your potassium level. I also encourage you to share what you learned today with your friends, family, community, and networks. Spreading your knowledge about high potassium can help save lives. Before we get started with our first presentation, we have a quick word from our sponsor, V4 Pharma. Thank you for taking part in Are You OK? A campaign that is in support of National High Potassium Awareness Day that's taking place on May the 1st. This is where we aim to raise awareness about the effects of high potassium and what it can have on people living with kidney disease. My name is Molly Painter and I lead the US for B4 Pharma and it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. In the US and globally, we strive to help people 
living with kidney disease to lead better, healthier lives and aim to become a leader in developing solutions. We want to do this to help treat the complications of kidney disease, including high potassium. We're proud to continue our partnership with the American Association of Kidney Patients to raise awareness around potassium management among kidney patients. Nearly 3 million people in the U.S. with chronic kidney disease and or heart failure are living with high potassium levels. And at B4 Pharma, we're committed to empowering patients to become better educated about their disease. So on this important day, thank you so much for doing your part. And a matter of fact, all year round, for both the community to spread the word about potassium management and what it means to those living with kidney disease. Welcome back, and without further ado, I'd like to make a warm welcome for our first presenter, Dr. Cindy Smith. Dr. Smith is a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner, board certified family nurse practitioner, and a certified nephrology nurse practitioner. She is currently a clinical coordinator for ambulatory care for Herschel Woody Williams Veterans Administration Medical Center in Huntington, West Virginia. Dr. Smith has participated in AAKP's National High Potassium Awareness Day event since 2020, and it's an honor to have her join us again. Dr. Smith, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Diana, and a big thank you to the AAKP for leading such an important uh, awareness campaign regarding potassium and for really successfully marking May 1st as National High Potassium Awareness Day. Uh, I am Dr. Cynthia Smith, and it is my great pleasure to speak to you today about potassium, in particular regarding high potassium. So what is potassium? Well, potassium is an electrically charged mineral, and it's a very important nutrient for the body. Uh, in, in the blood work, we'll call this an electrolyte. And it's a very, very important one because it plays a critical role in keeping the nervous system and the muscles working properly. Now, you're going to find potassium throughout the entire body. And one of the really important parts of the body that is so important to have a good normal potassium level is regards to the heart and how that heart is functioning. Now, because potassium is so important, the body has a very complex system to keep this potassium within a normal range. So it always reminds me of the story of Goldilocks. You don't want it too high and you don't want it too, too, uh, too low. You want it just right. And as you probably already figured, the kidneys play a key role in keeping this potassium at a normal level. So what is a normal potassium level? Well, depends on what lab you look at, but for most labs, a normal potassium level is between 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Now, potassium can be too low, and this is generally defined as being under 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. And this low potassium, when we see it, is called hypokalemia. Now, what we're particularly concerned with, what we're talking about today, is the opposite end of the spectrum, or what we call hyperkalemia. And that's when the potassium levels start to go too high. Now, generally, this is defined as a potassium of 5.1 or higher. Now, you see where the 5.1 comes for, for, for the National High Potassium Awareness Day. And the, how high the potassium goes broke down into what we call mild, moderate, or severe hyperkalemia. So if potassium is going up just a little bit between 5.1 to 5.5, we call that mild hyperkalemia. When it starts to get above 5.5, up to 6, we really start to worry more. Uh, that's called moderate hyperkalemia. And we really don't want it to go above 6 because that's now considered severe hyperkalemia. All right, so if we look at potassium and how much is in the body itself, we want to know where is the potassium located. So 90% of all the potassium in the body is located in the cells themselves which means that only about 2% is located outside the cells, for example, in, in the bloodstream. So where is all this potassium stored? Well, the biggest storage site for potassium is actually in the muscles themselves. 
And why is it important that there's this big difference between what's in the cells and what is outside of the cells? Well, this is important because this plays a critical role in the communication of the body to know when the nerves need to fire, when the muscles need to contract. And a key player in this is what's called the sodium potassium ATPase pump. I'm not going to torture the pathophysiology, but it's really important that there's this big difference between what's inside of the cells and outside of the cells in order to cause those nerves to fire and again those muscles to contract. If we look at how much potassium is in the body overall, well it depends on how much we weigh. And the estimates are is that we have 50 milli equivalents for every kilogram that we weigh. And a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So that means if you weigh 154 pounds, you have about a total body store of potassium around 3,500 milliequivalents. Now, how much potassium that we take into our bodies is going to vary depending upon what we eat. But so as I just alluded to, where our bodies don't make potassium, we have to ingest potassium. So it's going to vary. Dietary estimates of how much diet, how much potassium we get in our diet varies from a low of around 2,320 to a high of around 3,400 milligrams per day. And ironically, there is a lot of debate that the American diet doesn't contain enough potassium. But for kidney patients, that's not usually the case at all, as we're going to learn here in just a few minutes. Now, when we eat foods that contain potassium, Almost all of this potassium is absorbed through our intestines. They do a great job of pulling that potassium into our body. But as the potassium is pulled into our body, the potassium level in the blood is going to start going up. Well, as it starts going up, the body recognizes this and it's going to put the potassium into storage until it can balance out. So this rapid shift of potassium into the skeletal muscles is what's called an acute response. And a lot of things play a role in quickly moving this potassium into storage into those muscles. Uh, things, for example, such as insulin and catecholamines and the potassium level itself are going to play a role in how quickly we need to get that potassium moved into the muscles. Now, we can't keep it there forever. We got to keep it balanced. So over the long haul, that potassium is going to be balanced with the kidneys being the key player in that. Again, the kidneys are responsible for 90% of maintaining the potassium balance. Now, we do have a backup system and it's our GI tract. And the GI tract helps, but it only is responsible for, for maintaining about 10% of the potassium balance itself. And a really important thing to recognize is normal function kidneys are going to take several hours to excrete this excess potassium. So it's not a fast process. Now, the kidney's absorption and working with the potassium is a very, very complex process. And we're still learning new things about the kidney all the time. But a really important thing to recognize is that as that kidney function decreases, the kidneys are going to have a harder and harder time keeping the potassium within the normal range. And what this means is that once that potassium starts to go up about 5.1, now we're into that hyperkalemia. And so this becomes a very, very real risk that we're going to develop these high potassium levels with the weakening kidney, particularly once the kidney function drops below at what's called an estimated glomerular filtration rate of around 15 to 20. So if you're familiar with kidney stages, and we talk about the estimated glomerular filtration rate, this is really once the kidneys start moving into what's called stage four. We're not at dialysis level, which is once the kidneys go into stage five or filtration rate under that 15 mark. But this level, those kidneys are really going to start having trouble around stage four. Now, this high potassium issue can happen when kidneys are stronger, but majority of the time it's going to be as they get weaker, particularly into this stage four level. And it's interesting that as the kidneys are trying to compensate and keep things balanced and they've done such a great job, 
for such a long time, but as they're getting weaker and weaker for a while, the gut actually will step up and it will try to help get rid of some of this excess potassium itself. Problem is it's not the kidneys and it's not going to do the great job that the kidneys do. So it's not a very good backup system. It's there, but it's not a very good backup system. So I wanted to be sure to touch upon the two key kidney tests. And we've already alluded to the estimated glomerular filtration rate, but let's talk about that a little bit more. Now we call it estimated because we can't physically go in there and measure what's happening in the glomerulus itself. That's where that blood hits that hits those filters and it's being filtered right there before it goes into the rest of the nephron where that complex process of absorption and excretion occurs. So what the EGFR actually is, and if you've ever looked at a blood test and seen it on there and wondered what it is, what it actually is, is it's a math, mathematical formula that takes into account the uniqueness of you. So it's going to look at your creatinine, it's going to look at gender, and it's going to look at age to give us a much truer idea of what the kidney function is truly doing. The other key test we look at is what's called a urine albumin to creatinine ratio. And basically, this is a, this is a urine test. An EGFR is a blood test, but now we're going to look at the urine itself. And what we're actually looking for is a type of protein called albumin. So very, very small molecules, and a few of them are going to slip through those filters naturally. But when we start seeing a lot of them slipping through these filters, we know that that's a warning. That's a big warning, and actually the earliest warning that damage is occurring in those filtering units itself. And this is often seen before the kidney function itself decreases. And unfortunately, this elevation of this albumin in the urine is a very common finding in those who have chronic kidney disease. So in going back and thinking about potassium, studies have found that those who start to develop a high potassium issue, that unfortunately about 50% of people who have start this process are going to have two or more episodes of high potassium again within a course of a year. So one of the things that wasn't always really recognized or appreciated is high potassium can become a chronic condition and it's, it can occur off and on. And some of these episodes can become very, very frequent. And research is also starting to suggest that these episodes between these high potassium uh, when they occur, is can become shorter and shorter. And so if, if you start having trouble with high potassium, very important to keep an eye on those levels, keep that blood checked, because these episodes may become more frequent and there may be a shorter time period between them. Now, for those patients whose kidneys have advanced to what we call end-stage kidney disease, and they're at the level where they require dialysis, unfortunately, absolutely dependent upon the dialysis and maintaining that low potassium diet to keep those potassium levels within normal limits. Fortunately, once kidneys get to the level that dialysis required, they're just not strong enough on their own to keep that potassium level safe. Now, an interesting thing to note is that because of advances in medicine, we now have something called potassium binder therapy. And there's two of them, which is great. It's always great when we have choices. And the nice thing is that there is actually great studies in, the, in patients who are on dialysis that we may have another tool in the toolkit, as we like to say in my line of work, that allows us to help keep that potassium within normal limits. But again, dialysis and a low potassium diet are so important in patients who require dialysis itself. So I've alluded to the kidneys being the big power player in keeping potassium normal. Absolutely so important. But there are other things that contribute and lead to somebody having a high potassium. And if you look at the picture I have over there on the right, that's actually a picture of the nephron. And we've got a million in each kidney, which is amazing. And it's such complicated anatomy. And if we think about that complicated anatomy and the influences and things that can impact it, there are several things. So not just having kidney disease, but having issues such as congestive heart failure, having diabetes mellitus, 
having resistant hypertension, that's, that's blood pressure that is really, really difficult to control and often requires multiple medications just to keep it within normal limits. If we have trouble keeping the acid level in our blood balanced, and ironically, the kidney plays a big role in that and helping keep that normal, but our GI tract and our lungs are in there too. So if they're not working right, the blood's getting acidic, kidney's gonna struggle even more to keep the potassium normal. If we have trouble with something, if we have, for example, a GI bleed, a gastrointestinal bleed, those breakdown of those cells are gonna pour potassium into the system. Kenny's gonna try to fix it the best it can, but that can cause the potassium to go up very quickly. And ironically, and again, unfortunately, it's very, very common when people have trouble with kidney disease to often have trouble with their heart. Uh, we often say bad heart, bad kidneys, bad kidneys, bad heart, huge correlation between the two. And if we think about diabetes mellitus, number one reason that kidneys get damaged, blood pressure is number two. It's so already multiple things impacting those kidneys. And a final consideration is about the use of certain medications themselves that may in and Inadvertently trick the kidneys, we'll say, into holding on to the potassium and not getting rid of it the way that we want to. So there are multiple medications that can contribute to hyperkalemia. If we start on the left side of the list, right off the bat are, well, potassium supplements. And so it's not uncommon sometimes for patients to present to the kidney practice ironically still on potassium supplements that are starting to have trouble with high potassium episodes. That's pretty easy. We just take them off of those potassium supplements because remember, as that kidney is weakening, it's going to have trouble you know, getting rid of potassium. So a lot of times we don't need or require potassium supplements. Now, other medications that can cause high potassium are oftentimes very important to protect the heart. Uh, for example, beta blockers, uh, digoxin, which will help heart beat better. Medications like heparin that can help prevent clotting. Also to consider are the NSAIDs and the COX-2 inhibitors that a lot of times kidney patients have been advised already, don't take these medications. And NSAIDs are things such as ibuprofen or the brand names such as Motrin or Aleve. And while these are wonderful for arthritis pain, unfortunately what they can do is they can cause a diminishment of blood flow into the kidney, which can lead to this high potassium effect. On the prescription side, we have things called COX-2 inhibitors, and these are brand names such as Salabrex or Mobic. Again, same issue as with the NSAIDs, that diminishment of blood flow into the kidney, it can lead to a high potassium level. So two, two good reasons we like to avoid them in patients who have chronic kidney disease. Also important to recognize is that one of the drug classes we use when somebody's had a kidney transplant to help them with their immune system not rejecting the kidney what we call immune, immunosuppressants, are the calciurean inhibitors. So in, with use of drugs like tacrolimus and cyclosporin, they're fantastic at reminding the immune system not to pick on that transplanted kidney, but they can inadvertently cause that kidney to hold on to potassium. Now, a particular importance of the medications that are on this list are what are called RAS inhibitors. And these are things such as the ACE inhibitors, the antigen receptor blockers, and also things like the mineral corticoid receptor and antagonists, which are things such as spirolactone. So if we look at the ACE inhibitors, these all end in pril, so things like lisinopril or ramipril or captopril, and the angiotensin receptor blockers. These are things that all end in sartan, like losartan. And what these medications do is they really help protect the kidney from itself. So we talked earlier about one of the big things that we worry about is the kidney spilling that albumin into the urine. I always compare the kidney to a coffee maker and I'll tell the patients, I want good coffee in your coffee pot, but I don't want to find coffee grounds. And so what these medications do is they go into the kidney and they basically slow down that blood flow. The idea being they're not going to push against that filter as much. We're going to slow down the loss of that protein into the urine. 
And that means that we're going to keep the kidneys around longer. That's the power of these medicines. They're also fantastic at protecting the heart. Additional consideration in a medicine that's not on this list I want to point out is we do want to be cautious with use of certain antibiotics, in particular one that's called Bactrim. That's the brand name for it. Uh, this is trimethoprene sulfamethazole. You don't have to remember that if you can remember Bactrim. Or if you can remember, somebody's going to put you on an antibiotic, particularly for a urinary tract infection, which is where this medicine is often used. You may want to point out, hey, I've had some trouble with my kidneys and potassium in the past. Is this antibiotic going to affect, affect that? Because that is, is, a very, is a very common problem with use of, of Bactrim is causing that kidney to inadvertently hold on to that potassium. So we've already touched upon the importance of the RAS inhibitor therapy, but let's dive a little bit deeper in, in, into, into it. So RAS inhibitors, the two power players being those ACE inhibitors and those angiotemptin receptor blockers. And they're useful for so many things other than protecting the kidney from itself. They're useful for somebody who's had a heart attack and protecting the heart and helping it heal. They're so incredible at helping control the blood pressure. And that's an important thing to recognize too, is that last year, the international organization, KDGO, which looks at all the research regarding kidneys and how we can protect the kidneys, is really recommending we tighten up our blood pressure control even more, and if possible, to do so using this type of medication. The other thing too, what we know these medicines do is they really help patients who have congestive heart failure. If they have, that heart is just not beating very strong, these medications can really help the heart work even better. And that's actually really great for the kidneys too, because of how much blood is coming off of that heart going straight to that kidney. It's around 20%, which is impressive when you think about the size of the kidney, which is only about the size of your hand, how much blood goes straight from the heart to the kidney. Now, why is use of these medicines so important? Well, from a kidney person's viewpoint, again, key to slowing the worsening of the kidney function. It means we're hoping to delay dialysis. But we also know we're going to significantly reduce the number of cardiovascular events. That means we're protecting your heart. And of special importance is it really does reduce the risk of death for all reasons, or what we call all causes. Now, hyperkalemia, if it starts to get too high, can lead to life-threatening conditions. And one of the important things to recognize is this is really becomes a big issue if that potassium jumps up really, 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 really quickly. So it's not unusual if you've ever been in a dialysis unit, you'll hear patients swap stories about how high their potassium has been when they came in. If you've ever kind of scratched your head and go, well, gosh, they're walking around with these really scary potassiums. Well, body kind of adapted to it, and it's usually a little bit more of a slower process. But if it jumps up really, really quickly, very fast, it's going to cause that shift in that imbalance, that difference between what's in the cells and outside of the cells. And now the body gets all confused, and it doesn't really know what to do in terms of contract and how the nervous system is supposed to work. And this can lead to things, if the potassium gets too high, such as respiratory failure, because the diaphragm just basically becomes paralyzed. The heart doesn't really know how to beat properly, can develop an arrhythmia as a regular heartbeat. This can lead to the, the bottom part of the heart just literally shaking, what's called ventricular fibrillation. That's not how the heart's supposed to beat. Just shaking is not a good thing at all. This can lead to a heart attack and it can cause sudden death. And the frightening thing with potassium is a lot of times you may not have symptoms until it's too high. And I don't want to say too late. It's not always very symptomatic. And if you do see symptoms, they might actually be pretty mild, such as muscle weakness, twitching, or cramping. So if you worry that your potassium might be going too high, very important to get a blood test. And these are really, really easy to get. This is a standard blood test. And it's also a reason sometimes why your provider may be saying, hey, I need to check you a little bit more often because you're at risk for that high potassium or you've had those high potassium levels in the past. 
And if potassium levels go up too high, sometimes that means we may end up needing the emergency room or we may end up needing to become hospitalized. And a lot of times in the emergency room, they're going to be looking for those typical EKG changes. Alluded to when that potassium is going up too high, that heart's not really sure sometimes how to beat properly. But the scary thing is, is you can't always trust the EKG itself at first. Uh, these changes can show up. But if you think, oh, I got this blood test, I got an EKG, or, or I haven't had my blood test, I'm just going to get this EKG. The EKG may not necessarily show when that potassium is becoming too dangerous because one study found that half of all patients who had a potassium of 6.5 or greater, they did not show those characteristic changes. Only about half of them did. So if in doubt, get, get checked out. So when potassium goes too high, this may warrant emergency treatment to get that potassium down. And so when potassium is going up too high, we worry about it affecting the heart and the heart knowing how to beat properly. So the first thing we have to do if we want to protect the system, we have to protect the heart. And we're going to do that by immediately giving either calcium gluconate or calcium chloride through an IV. Now, the idea with this is to calm the heart down. This is not going to bring the potassium down but it's going to calm the heart down because it doesn't know what to think about this high potassium. It's causing the heart to become confused in the way it's supposed to beat. Now, the problem with giving IV calcium is while it protects the heart, there's two issues. Number one, it's not going to last very long, only about 30 to 60 minutes. And number two, it's not going to get rid of the potassium. So what we have to do is very, very quickly is we have to shift the potassium into the cells ourselves. And there's a couple of ways to do this. Uh, it can be done by giving somebody insulin. But if you give somebody insulin and they don't have a really, really, really high blood sugar, well, that's going to make their blood sugar drop too low. So it's usually given with, with, with dextrose or sugar for that reason. And if you're a diabetic and you've ever heard your kidney doctor say, hey, if you take more insulin, you may find that you don't get some of these high potassium episodes because insulin plays that key role in helping push potassium into the cells. So just something to think about. As I know, controlling diabetes is really, really hard, but having that, having that insulin you know, properly maintained can really, really help keep potassium levels normal. Now, other options that will quickly shift potassium into the cells is use of things such as the beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. This is albuterol, so it's like getting a super, super fancy nebulizer treatment. But again, this effects only lasts for a short time. In this case, we've shoved it into those muscles, but the effect is only going to last two to six hours before the potassium starts coming back out. So in terms of trying to get rid of this excess potassium when we're having a high potassium episode, well, there's several ways that it can be done. A dialysis will certainly remove potassium from the body. Now, if you're not on dialysis, we're not going to put you on dialysis for this reason. So we're going to look at alternative things. And that's where we're going to jump in. We're going to look at the kidney. We're going to say, okay, can we help the kidney pee it off? And we'll often use a specific type of diuretic called a loop diuretic that will help push some of that potassium out into the urine and help get it out of there. We're also going to look at the acidity level of the blood. And if, and if it's running too low or what we call metabolic acidosis, we can often use sodium bicarbonate to help kind of balance that out, help, help with that excretion process. The other thing too is we can also use potassium binder therapy. And it's the idea now of, hey, wait a minute, that gut's been trying to help us out. It can't do a lot like the kidney scan, but we can focus on the GI tract and we can remove potassium through that system. So when we're thinking about chronic management of high potassium or hyperkalemia, you know, a couple of thoughts. We may have got to this position because, oh my goodness, our potassium went up too high and we required going to the emergency room or maybe even a hospitalization. Or we may be on medications that are kind of keeping that potassium up a little bit higher than we like to see it and we don't want it to get too high. 
or we just may simply have a, a kidneys that just can't get rid of enough potassium. So regardless, we have to think about how we're going to chronically manage these high potassium episodes. Like I said, we now recognize that having trouble with high potassium is oftentimes a chronic intermittent condition. So what are some of the considerations to get the potassium back down to normal? Well, a lot of times we will use diuretics to help the kidneys basically kind of excrete that potassium into the urine. So we're basically going to pee it off. And there's several types of diuretics that can do this, such as loop diuretics or the thiazide diuretics. So you may find where we they used to give you diuretics and say, oh, I have to give you potassium. Now we're giving diuretics and not giving you potassium to hope to get rid of that extra potassium. And we often find we benefit from these because a lot of times kidney patients struggle with not being able to get rid of the so diuretics and be very helpful. Another thing that we often will think about is we'll go back to those kidney protective medications and we'll look and say, oh my gosh, do we, should we take this dose down a little bit or should we stop these medications? And remember, we don't always use them just for chronic kidney disease. We use them for other conditions too, such as heart failure. So we really, really don't like to do this if we can help it because we know the benefits of these medications. But sometimes you have to give that an honest look to see, it, should we pull this back because it, it's safer and it's what you, you have to do. But we don't like to and we try to find ways around this if we possibly can. An important thing to point out too is in terms of herbal supplement use, really anybody who has chronic kidney disease for the most part really, really, really wants to avoid herbal supplements. Now, there are some that we do have some understanding about, things such as fish oil, but a lot of herbal supplements that are out there, we just don't have research about them in terms of kidney disease. And what we have found is that several of them can actually trick the kidney into holding on to potassium. So something to be very, very aware of before you just, if you want to try any kind of herbal supplement, talk to your kidney clinician about that to see if this would be a good idea. For the most part, we just may not know when we will usually advise, hey, probably best just to avoid that. Now, I alluded to use of the, the GI tract. And it's so great that we kind of have this backup system that will help us get rid of extra potassium that'll help the kidney out. And we do have use of what, of what are called potassium binders to remove the potassium through the GI tract, basically going, taking the potassium out through our bowel movements. We have three medications that are, that are available. Uh, we have sodium polystyrene sulfonate, which is an older medication and, and can cause a lot of GI side effects. And we're very fortunate now because we have two better tolerated medications out that have been out for several years. Uh, this is pteromir and sodium zirconium psychosilicate. And both of these medications have been studied in patients with kidney disease and also not just kidney disease, but diabetes and heart failure. So I absolutely love that, that really looking at people who often struggle the, the most with high potassium was where these drugs really were studied. And as I alluded to earlier, even have been evaluated, both of them, in patients who require dialysis. Now, overall, for patients who have kidney disease, who have high potassium, no doubt uh, dietary reduction of potassium is felt to be very, very beneficial. And I know Carol's going to do a great uh, job of coming here talking, talking to us about that. So thank you so much for your time and attention today. It's my pleasure to be back here again. I'm going to turn this back over to Diana with the AAKP. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you again for a fantastic presentation laying the fame framework for potassium management. I would now like to welcome our next speaker, Ms. Carolyn Bybig. Carolyn is a registered dietitian and a certified clinical transplant dietitian. After her years at the George Washington University Hospital as a kidney transplant dietitian, Carolyn has now joined Inova Heart and Vascular Institute as a transplant dietitian. She became interested in transplant nutrition when her nephew was born with only one working kidney. 
Carolyn has participated in a number of AAKP events over the years, and it's our honor to have her return to this year's Are You OK Potassium event. Carolyn, I appreciate you joining us from Washington, DC, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Diana, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you to the AAKP for having me once again for your National High Potassium Awareness Day. So today we're gonna talk about how to manage your potassium from day to day. Some of our objectives we're gonna talk about are gonna be your daily potassium goal, how to look at a label to see about potassium, different things about portion size, why they matter, how you can juggle some higher potassium foods because of portion size. That kind of leads into our tips and tricks for managing your potassium. And then also we're gonna talk about meal planning because that way you're able to add in some of those higher potassium foods that you're looking to possibly eat because you miss them. Your daily potassium guide, right? We're looking for an average kind of target to be about 2000 milligrams of potassium per day. Um, what does that mean? Like if you're gonna be eating a single serving food, like maybe a snack or something, if they have about 250 milligrams of potassium or more, that's gonna be considered a high potassium food. Um, when it's about 150 to 250 milligrams of potassium that you would find on the label, that's gonna be considered about a moderate potassium food. Anything under 150 milligrams is really a pretty low potassium food. And you might have a green light to have more of those than the higher potassium foods. Um, now that's for a single serving food. However, when you're thinking about a meal, you can't just have only 250 milligrams of potassium in a meal. That doesn't make that a high potassium meal. So what you're looking to, for a goal is to have your foods to be about 600 to 700 milligrams of potassium, or roughly about 1,800 to 2,100 milligrams of potassium per day. We have some new Qdoki guidelines for potassium and just kind of all of nutrition when it comes to kidney disease. And what they're really thinking about is not about focusing exactly on these numbers like I just gave you, right? Um, they're more about trying to have you manage your potassium, more about low potassium foods, high potassium food, medium potassium foods, but not be focused so much on that number. And we'll kind of get into how to do this a little bit further down in the presentation. So what can you eat? Pretty much almost anything, which is great. When people think about living with kidney disease and living with uh, being on dialysis, a lot of times you're like, oh, I can't eat anything. There's nothing as, nothing matches my diet, all my favorite foods don't fit. And a lot of times it's because of potassium and which is a big deal. We don't wanna have high potassium. Um, so what you wanna do is choose some foods that are gonna help keep you full, right? So you're gonna to wanna to choose foods with fiber. Fiber stays in your, in your gut a little bit longer and helps keep you full. Choose foods with protein. Protein also is harder to break down and takes a little bit longer in your GI tract and it keeps you full. Same thing with fat. I know like back in the 80s and 90s, you know, fat was the enemy, but it's not so much now. We know more about different types of fat. And so monounsaturated fats, the olive oils, the canola oils, those are good for us fats. So we wanna stay away from the saturated fats, the fats that are solid at room temperature. But having like a, cooking with a little bit of olive oil or things like that will help keep you full a little bit longer. And when you're meal planning and when you're thinking about what to eat and how to eat and the foods, you wanna choose larger portions of those lower potassium foods, like the pineapples and the broccolis and the carrots and the lettuce and the raspberries, things like that. And you wanna limit or have smaller portions of those higher potassium foods, like cooked spinach or tomatoes, maybe even a double boiled potato, still, um, lower in potassium than regular potatoes, but you still they're still considered a higher potassium foods. Maybe even, you might even be able to have a half a banana every day or every other day if bananas are something that you would like, but choosing larger portions of lower potassium foods and smaller portions of higher potassium foods helps keep your diet balanced and you're able to have a little bit more variety. 
you go to the grocery store and you're looking at foods and what can I eat and what's in this box and what's in this bag and you look at the label and labels are confusing, right? So you got to think, hmm, when you're looking at these food labels, you got to ask yourself some questions, right? So is this food going to be a single serving food or is this food part of a dish that I'm going to be making? Maybe it's a lasagna, maybe it's, you know, tacos, maybe it's some type of casserole. And then you have to then plan accordingly for that dish. If it's a single serving food, like a snack or something like that, then what you want to do is look at the potassium per serving. If we look at this label, that potassium serving size is, or the potassium for the serving is 240 milligrams, which is a single serving food. It's a moderate potassium. It's on the higher side of moderate. So you wouldn't want to eat a whole bunch of this, right, in one sitting. And that's kind of another question you want to ask yourself. Will this serving size fill me up? You look at the top of it and it tells you that there's eight servings per container and a serving size of this particular item is two thirds of a cup. So you think to yourself, hmm, can I eat just one serving? And if you can, then that's a moderate si um, amount of potassium and that'll be just fine for you. But if you're like, nope, I think I'm gonna have to eat the entire box of this food, then it would be too high of a potassium. So that's how serving size can come into play. And then always be thinking about the different types. Like, is it a low potassium food? Is it 150 milligrams or under for that serving? Is it a high potassium food? Is it over 250? And those are really the numbers you need to remember. You know, under 150, over 250. And like we were saying, portions matter, right? So if you think about what is a portion size, so any type of like meat, right? It's going to be about the size of a card deck. It's about three ounces. Um, uh, one cup of veggies is about the size of a baseball. Um, so you want to choose like if you're going to have some vegetables, choosing the low potassium vegetables as a, an entire cup would be the way to do it. Um, one small fruit is about a half a cup or the, about the size of a tennis ball. An ounce of cheese is about the size of four dice or maybe the quarter part of your palm. Um, a half a cup of pasta or a half a cup of rice is actually a serving size of pasta and rice because of all of the carbohydrates in there. If you wanted to have a pasta dish, trying to add more vegetables, lower potassium vegetables, maybe some ground turkey to there and to your half a cup of pasta or your half a cup of rice would be a great way to make it a little bit larger of a portion, but not overdo the pasta or the rice. And then when you think about um, butters or nut butters, um, it's about a teaspoon or the tip of your thumb. And those are all ways that if you're following those portion sizes, you're going to be able to manage your, your, your potassium a little bit better. So back to these portions, right? We've learned a little bit more about potassium and its absorption rate. Kind of similar to phosphorus, it is the potassium that you find in animal products. So in steak or salmon or turkey or chicken or is going to be better absorbed by our bodies because it's not bound to different fibers. So if you are, and I know we tell you to eat a whole bunch of, you know, if you're on dialysis, oh, you need a lot of protein, 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 protein. So you could think about like, instead of choosing a sirloin steak that in eight ounces, you could do half of that and you're going to cut that potassium in half. Or you could do four ounces of flank steak and be even lower. Um, salmon, salmon is full of great omega-3 fatty acids. It's good for the heart. It's good for all around, but it does have a lot of potassium in it, right? So you could do a half of um, a salmon filet. So doing three ounces of salmon or even shrimp, right? A big old jumbo shrimp. And actually, if you get three jumbo shrimp, that's a pretty decent portion when we're talking about the extra jumbo shrimp. And that's a pretty low potassium food. Chicken, right? Chicken is super healthy. It's lean. It's all these great things. But, you know, one chicken breast, which is about six ounces, is over, you know, 400 milligrams of potassium. So try having a, a half of a chicken breast, which is about the size of your palm, which is an appropriate size um, for portion size. Or you could even do one thigh 
or maybe, you know, thighs are delicious. They're, they're pretty easy to cook. Um, they have a lot of flavor. Turkey wings with skin, you know, those have a lot of potassium, but you could do a half of a wing or you could do some breast meat. All of those, you know, it's all about that portion size. So the larger the portion, you're going to have more potassium. So again, portions, right? So remember I was talking about how we've kind of done a little bit more research and we understand how potassium is, is, is absorbed a little bit better now, right? So when it comes to plant-based potassium, they're actually bound to what is called phytates or phytic acid. And that is a, a substance that our body is not able to absorb. And because of that, you don't absorb all of the potassium. Cooking does break those bonds, so you can absorb a little bit more of the potassium that's bound to those phytates, but it kind of helps open up some of those veggies that are good for us that we might not think that we could eat beforehand. Um, so a banana, instead of having a full medium-sized banana, which does have a lot of potassium in it, right? You could do like have a half a banana. That is considered a moderate potassium serving. So a half of a banana with your breakfast, that sounds lovely. Um, if you really like oranges, try a clementine instead. That's got about 100 milligrams less of potassium. Peaches, peaches are delicious and they're actually kind of considered on the lower potassium fruit side, but one large peach now is pretty high in potassium. It's a, considered a high potassium food, so try a smaller peach. Um, if you want to really get get on it, you can peel the peach and you're going to remove even more of the potassium. Squash, right? We always talk about how those hard squashes are, are high in potassium. And a cup of cooked butternut squash is pretty high in potassium. It's almost 600 milligrams. So cut up your squash, chop it up, measure a half a cup of it raw, and then cook it. And that's going to really reduce the amount of potassium. You could even try double, um, like soaking it to remove some of the potassium like you would for a um, potato. Or you could even try those yellow squash, or sometimes people call them summer squash. That actually a half a cup cooked is a really low potassium food. And that's a great way of adding some of those good squashes into your diet. Beans, right? We always talk about beans and like, oh, you can't eat beans. They're too high in potassium. Well, yeah, a cup of white northern beans is really, really high in potassium. You could try a, a half a cup of black beans or a half a cup of pinto beans. Sure, they're a little bit elevated in potassium, but no more so than like a chicken breast. So if you wanted to, you could do, if you wanted to do beans and rice for, for dinner, that's fine. Just don't add any uh, meat to it. If you want to do um, chili, you could do something like that and not add any meat, but it had the beans. So some tips to lower potassium. Peel the skin when you have any type of fruit, any type of vegetable, um, cucumbers, uh, peaches, apples. My mother always told me when I was little, you know, like, oh, Carolyn, eat the skin. That's where all the nutrients are. So if you need to follow a low potassium diet, eat the, <laughs> peel the skin. That's where all the potassium is, right? Any type of hard vegetable like a potato or that like butternut squash or acorn, acorn squash, peel it, dice it, soak it in at least two times the amount of water, if not up to like five times the amount of water in a large pot. Stick it in the refrigerator, soak it overnight, drain it, rinse it. Then you can boil it. Don't boil it all the way till it's done. Boil it halfway, drain it, rinse it, and then boil it again, and you're going to remove a lot of potassium from those foods. And then you could make a mashed potato or a mashed um, squash or something like that, a squash puree or something. Um, lemon or avoid juice. Even cranberry juice, which is low in potassium, still has some potassium, right? So choose water, greens right? We always are talking about, oh, don't eat any greens. Don't do this. You know, they're so high in potassium and it's true. They really are. So you can, if you think about it, if you look at those pictures down there, a cup of spinach versus cooked spinach, right? 
I think that's two. That's a two cup picture, and a, two cups of spinach cooked down is going to give you a half a cup of cooked spinach. Well, instead of doing that, if you wanted cooked spinach, right, or a, any type of cooked green, measure out a one cup portion, and then cook it, and you'll have it. You won't. That way, you won't over eat those higher potassium greens. Also, if you do cook it, boil the greens and drain the cooking liquid. Drain any of that liquid. If you saute it, there's gonna, it's gonna release some fluid. Drain it and you will end up removing some of that potassium. And especially if you're only, if you're already cooking in a one um, portion raw, then you're gonna have the right amount of potassium in there how to manage some higher potassium foods, right? What can you do? Try and limit high potassium foods to no more than once a day. And if you have higher potassium, then maybe only a couple of times a week, right? And it all really does depend on your current potassium levels. And if you're in dialysis or on dialysis, you get your potassium checked monthly. And if it's a little bit elevated, you might be getting it checked weekly. If you if you do hemodialysis, um, you might have a little bit more of a restriction versus if you were to do peritoneal dialysis, you might have a little bit less restriction. But thinking about those higher potassium foods like the tomatoes or the avocados or the artichokes or the beans and things like that and the cooked greens, try to limit those to one portion, no more than once a day. Um, and always keeping everything within the recommended portion size, um, choosing natural sources of potassium versus additives, just like phosphorus, those potassium additives are easily absorbed by our body versus like we talked about earlier with the phytic acid and the phytates being bound to those and so it's not as absorbed. And also you might be on a potassium binder. Don't forget your potassium binder, that's there to help keep your potassium nice and even and in the right range. On the other side of the screen, some quick tips, right? So you really like tomatoes. Well, have a have a salad full of lower potassium vegetables, right? So some iceberg lettuce or some romaine lettuce, um, some onions and cucumbers, bell peppers, and then pop in a couple of grape tomato, tomatoes. Th that would be just fine. That's not going to over do your potassium for that meal. You Again, you really like tomatoes. Maybe it's summertime and it's, you know, tomatoes are in the peak of their season and you really want to sandwich it with a slice of tomato. That's fine, right? Get the best, juiciest, most delicious looking tomato and cut a, a not a huge thick slice, but maybe a nice thinner slice of tomato and have that on your sandwich. If you're going to do potatoes or any type of hard kind of squash, soak them dice them, soak them, double boil them, and that makes it easier for you to have those higher potassium hard like root vegetables. Um, avocado, avocado is really high in potassium, but if you know your potassium numbers and your potassium is not over, you could do a thin slice of avocado on a taco. So like maybe you have three tacos for dinner, three little thin slices of avocado can really go a long way flavor wise and texture wise but it's not going to really boost that um, potassium too much. If you really like greens, eat them raw. Or like I said earlier, you can cook them, portion out a raw portion, and then cook that portion separately. And that way you know that you're getting the, the, that right amount of potassium. You like oranges, have a clementine instead. They're smaller, they have less potassium. So higher potassium foods really do have a place on your plate if you have a plan. And of course, also, if your potassium is not too high. So we're wanting that potassium to be, you know, five or under. Even if you're on dialysis, five or under is a good space to be. So meal planning, right? It's all going to come down to meal planning. When you have a plan, then you're able to add in those smaller portions of those high potassium foods. So take a day a week and plan out your meals. There are many places that have lots of good, healthy, kidney-friendly recipes out there. The AAKP certainly has some, which we'll see later um, on in this presentation. But make a plan. Make your grocery list. Stick to your list when you go to the grocery store. Going to the grocery store, you got to read those labels. You've got to make sure that you are 
following that list and you're not just accidentally adding in some of those higher potassium foods. And you really should be label reading because maybe one version of cracker has more potassium than a different version of cracker. So looking and judging between the different potassium levels on those labels, which we're lucky now that they're put those potassium levels on the label. So that's um, very fortunate. It makes it a lot easier to go grocery shopping. Choosing kidney friendly recipes, right? Uh, the AAKP has a bunch of delicious recipes and you just need to request them on their website and they will send you a big old packet of these recipe cards. Make enough for two meals, right? So when you're meal prepping or planning your list, make sure that you add enough to have leftovers, to, you know, so that way you don't have to cook more than, you know, a few times a week. And that way you really have a good plan and you know where your potassium is coming from. Um, use one ingredient twice, right? So roasted chicken, grill some veggies and have roasted chicken and grilled veggies one day for dinner. And then the next day, turn that into tacos or a soft taco or a taco salad, all great, or fajitas. You know, there's a lot of times where you can use those ingredients, cook them once, but use them twice. Um, building your own meal kits, right? So when you get home from the grocery store, you have all these ingredients. Well, put them all in the refrigerator in a bag together. Have the recipe in that bag. And so when you get home from work or when you get home from wherever and you're tired and you don't really want to cook and you're like, oh, just pull it out of the refrigerator and there it is. There's your own meal kit. Um, and also you can make breakfast ahead of time and then just reheat your breakfast or find things that are really quick and easy to do for breakfast. So that way you're not just having higher potassium foods in the morning and kind of spending all your potassium dollars early on instead of throughout the day. So here's, we're gonna kind of quickly go through some recipes that I found from the AAKP. So one day menu, you could have some frittata muffins, right? Um, there is 110 milligrams of potassium per serving. They are low in calorie. They are, you can make them high in advance. And these wonderful cards, they all have these like little potassium checks. So that kind of gives you a little information about potassium and how to help manage it. So it's it's a nice little um, bonus. So lunch, steak fajita salad with an apple, right? Maybe you need to peel your apple. Um, that's still right within our target for a meal, right? It's 619 milligrams of potassium per serving. Maybe you had steak the night before or and now you're doing some leftovers, right? This might be a second day menu type of thing. Um, but again, there they are, you know, it's, telling, it's letting you know some like little potassium tips and tricks right there. But yeah, uh, 620 milligrams of potassium per serving right on target. Dinner, chicken pot pie. Who doesn't love a good chicken pot pie? It's one of my all-time favorites. And look at this, this one. I mean, like that's a pretty low potassium um, meal right there. So 418 milligrams, 420 milligrams of potassium per serving. Maybe you want to have two servings because you've had a lower potassium breakfast and you didn't have too much potassium for lunch. That means you could have an extra serving of this then. They're talking about how to help keep your potassium levels from getting too high. These um, recipe cards, I can't say enough about how wonderful they are. And now dessert. Who doesn't want dessert, right? And this dessert is super low in potassium because it's being made with cranberries instead of a higher potassium fruit. And cr cranberries have a ton of flavor. This is another great way to end your day with a lower potassium um, item. It's 79 milligrams of potassium. So that's awesome. So here you are with your one day kidney friendly menu that you sat down and you planned at home the day before, the night before, or like the week before. You went to the grocery store, you bought all this stuff, you put it all in your bag into your refrigerator. You had all of the recipe, those recipe cards in that bag. And now here you've gone, you've had frittata muffins, steak salad with an apple, chicken pot pie, and a cranberry coffee cake. That's great. If you didn't have seconds, well, now you have had 1,200, almost 1,300 calories. That's a very low calorie meal. So maybe you're trying to lose some weight to get on the transplant list or just to make yourself feel better. Well, this is a great filling day's worth of food and it's only 
under 1300 calories. It has a plenty of protein. You could add a little bit more protein, maybe have a couple more slices of steak or something like that on your salad. Maybe have an extra frittata muffin. Potassium, it's right in line. It's actually way under, right? So it's only 1200 milligrams of potassium and you had all of this delicious food. And phosphorus also, it hits all of those phosphorus levels, right? So it doesn't go over your phosphorus at all. If you were taking binders, you might not even have to take binders um, if you were to follow a meal plan like that for much longer because maybe your phosphorus levels will be down. But, you know, of course, you always want to check with your doctor when, <laughs> when deciding anything about medication. Thank you so much, Diana, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you to the AAKP for having me once again for your National High Potassium Awareness Day. Thank you, Carolyn, and as always, wonderful presentation on how we can eat kidney friendly and help manage our potassium intake through diet and nutrition. Before I introduce our next special guest speaker, we have a few words from our sponsor, AstraZeneca. My name is Crystal King and I am a CKD warrior. When I was 15 years old, I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease after waking up with like a very, very swollen face. Initially, I was afraid of sharing my message. Living with kidney disease can be shameful. People can be embarrassed by it. Or maybe you feel like I'm a private person. As my kidney disease progressed, I developed hyperkalemia, which is basically too much potassium in the body. Once you develop that, you really need to pay attention to your potassium. Being pregnant with Avery, I felt like I was battling for my life, like I was battling to stay alive. I remember walking around the house like I'm gonna run into a wall because I was that tired. Happy birthday, Avery. <laughs> I knew that I wanted to document my life with Avery as much as possible, just because I didn't know how long I was gonna be here. And it just became this lifestyle of experiences over things. Oh, oh I beat you. You did it. Getting the transplant, having the surgeries is definitely like a show of strength. And it does show him that his mom is strong and that she can take on anything and that she is a fighter and a warrior. And I do all of this for him. <laughs> Welcome back friends. And after reviewing these two great presentations, I'm sure you have some questions. Well, I'm pleased to share that the AKP has collected potassium related questions from viewers like you in advance and has invited the one and only Dr. Blake Schusterman, better known as the cooking doc, to respond. Listen close and take good notes. Take it away, doc. Hi, I'm Dr. Blake, the cooking doc. May 1st is National High Potassium Awareness Day, a campaign started by the American Association of Kidney Patients. I am a nephrologist and I'm also the cooking doc and you may know me better as the cooking doc. And today I'm so excited to answer all of your questions about high potassium. It's really important for people with kidney disease to understand how much potassium is in the food that they eat. Too much potassium, if it builds up in your blood, can cause heart problems. And if your kidneys are not filtering at 100%, or if you're on certain medicines that can raise the potassium in your blood, you can have a tendency to have high potassium buildup and put you at risk for these heart problems. So it's really important to monitor the amount of potassium that you take in if you have kidney disease and understand exactly what your potassium limits are. So the American Association of Kidney Patients solicited questions from all over the country regarding potassium, and boy, did we get some good ones. Some of these really made me think and are fantastic questions to help you understand why potassium is important and how potassium fits in to your kidney health. Let's start with Mark. Mark in North Carolina asks, I am newly diagnosed with kidney disease. What should I be doing as far as potassium for my health? Thanks, Mark, for that question. And Mark, know that you are not alone. There are 37 million people and climbing diagnosed with kidney disease in the United States. And I am so glad that you are invested in your health and trying to find out more information. 
The most important thing to do at this point for your potassium mark is to find out where along the spectrum you are with kidney disease and to know what your potassium levels are in your blood. The potassium limitations for people with kidney disease depend on a lot of different things. People with mild kidney disease, that's usually stage 1, stage 2, or stage 3A, usually don't have any potassium restrictions. And so for you, talk to your doctor or your dietitian and see if your potassium levels are normal and if you're at risk for high potassium. And if you're not, then you may not have any potassium limitations. On the other hand, if you're in stage 4 or 5 kidney disease or on dialysis, you may need to limit the potassium in your diet. So ask your doctor, what is my potassium level in my blood? Am I at risk for high potassium? And if you are at risk, then do exactly what you're doing. Look at the AAKP's potassium fact sheet and resources at ruok.org and keep trying to figure out what foods you may need to limit to manage that potassium in your diet. All right, our next question is from Cecilia in New York. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Cecilia in New York City asks, do I need to stop eating all foods, fruits, and vegetables that contain potassium while I'm on dialysis? Great question, Cecilia. The answer to that is no, because really it's impossible to not eat anything that has potassium in it because almost all foods have some amount of potassium. So if you're on dialysis, you may need to limit some of the potassium in your diet. Not everybody does, but a lot of people who are on dialysis do need to limit that potassium. But there are ways to still enjoy some of your favorite foods. For example, as soon as people see high potassium foods and limits, they get rid of all the bananas, all the oranges, all the tomatoes, and that will certainly lower the potassium in your diet, but there are some people that just love tomatoes. So if you're on a potassium restriction, but you love tomatoes, maybe you can have a slice of tomato, two slices of thin tomato on your sandwich. So you can make um, changes to your diet without giving up all foods, drinks, everything that has high potassium in it. The other thing to do is to really work with your dietitian. Your dietitian, if you're on dialysis, can tell you your risk for high potassium and can tell you whether or not you need to be very strict with your potassium intake or if you can have some of these things that have high potassium in them if you're careful with the rest of your diet. All right, our next question is from Joe in Florida. Joe asks, there's a lot of talk about fruits and veggies with high potassium, but what about drinks? Should I stay away from certain types of drinks like juice, sports drinks, or milk? Joseph, the answer to that is absolutely yes. Some of those things actually have more potassium in them than the fruits and vegetables that you're told are high potassium to begin with. For example, B8 juice is concentrated tomato juice with all kinds of vegetables in there, and those are very high potassium and very high sodium drinks. It's so concentrated that one cup of V8 can give you a huge amount of potassium. The same goes with sports drinks and even with some milks. Renee in Dallas asks, can you tell me more about salt substitutes with high potassium? So this is going to probably sound familiar to a lot of you, but many of you are told to eat a lower sodium diet. And sodium in the store for most of us is sodium chloride. So everybody with kidney disease needs to be on a lower sodium diet. So what do people do oftentimes is they go into the store and they buy the salt substitute, thinking that that will be a safer alternative to regular salt. The problem with the salt substitute is that instead of sodium chloride, it's potassium chloride. And so you may not be getting the same sodium load, but you are getting a potassium load. And if you need to limit the potassium in your diet, then the salt substitutes that are potassium chloride can be very, very dangerous. Plus, those potassium chloride substitutes, those salt substitutes, I don't think they taste very good. So stick with regular salt. Just use a little bit at a time. 
and limit your processed foods and eating out. And that's the way to lower the sodium in your diet, not by going with a salt substitute because that potassium chloride can be very dangerous. Adam from Iowa asks, are there foods to eat to help lower my potassium if and when my levels get too high? And that is just a great question. And the answer is no. There aren't any specific foods that you can eat to bring your potassium down once it gets too high. There are lots of medicines that you can take, things that can help you get rid of potassium through your urine or through your stool that can bring the potassium level down in your body. But once it gets too high from the foods you eat, there aren't foods that you can then take in that will bring that potassium level down to a safe level. I hope you're enjoying these questions and answers. Lana from Illinois asks, how does low potassium affect the heart or other areas of the body? Truth is that low potassium can cause just as many problems as high potassium. The symptoms of low potassium can also affect your heart, so they can cause irregular heart rhythms the same way the high potassium can. And low potassium can also make your muscles really weak. Potassium is involved in the way the nerves and the muscles move in the body. And if your level gets down to a very low and dangerous point, you can have trouble moving your muscles. The good news is that with regular blood tests, you can see where that potassium level is and hopefully avoid both high and low potassium levels. Boy, these are such great questions. Callie from Virginia asks, I love guacamole and salsa. Any tips to substitute so that I can make low potassium guacamole or salsa? Let's start with that salsa. So salsa is typically tomato based. And one of the ways to make low potassium substitutes is to find an ingredient that is the same color, sometimes a little bit of the same texture that you can use to replace it. So I often will do roasted red pepper salsa or red pepper salsa. We're using red peppers instead of tomatoes. Green peppers would work as well as a substitute for a green salsa. Fruit salsa, if you pick the right fruit, can substitute for your typical tomato salsa as well, as long as you pick a low potassium fruit. So pineapple is a great example of a low potassium fruit and a pineapple salsa with pineapple, cilantro, red onion, some lime juice can be a great substitute. Now what about the guacamole? The guacamole I think is a little bit harder, but still doable. Just like the salsa, in guacamole we want to pick an ingredient that is the same color and can be the same texture as avocados. Avocados are very high potassium fruits. So one way to do it would be to substitute green peas for that avocado. One cup of peas has about 350 milligrams of potassium. One cup of avocado has more than 700 milligrams of potassium. Jane from New York, Jane asks, with plant-based foods, you only absorb about half of the phosphorus. Is there any clinical research that is showing that we absorb less potassium with plant-based foods? Jane, I gotta tell you, I had to look up the answer to this one because I wasn't sure. But there is a lot of research going on out there to demonstrate if that potassium in plants is absorbed and causes the same amount of problems as other types of potassium. Because you mentioned phosphorus and the phosphorus is so interesting because in phosphorus, we find that the phosphorus in plants are wrapped in these things called phytates. And so high phosphorus plants don't cause as much phosphorus absorption as things like phosphorus additives that are in like packages of crackers and cookies. That phosphorus is absorbed as 100%. So it's a great question about whether or not the same thing goes for potassium. And I think the jury is still out. So for now, we still have to be very careful with high potassium fruits and vegetables because you can get really concentrated levels. One thing that's interesting though is that high potassium fruits and vegetables often have a lot of fiber, which keeps your gut moving, which keeps potassium leaving your body through your stool. And so that may offset some of the high potassium in the foods you are still eating. The jury's still out, but great question, and I hope we know more soon. 
Michelle from DC asks, I'd love to learn more about reading a food label and being able to tell if it's okay for a kidney transplant patient's diet. Thanks so much, Michelle, for that question. The thing about having a kidney transplant and being on a specific diet is it really depends on the level of your kidney disease. So people who have a kidney transplant can have stage one kidney disease where their kidney transplant works normally or they can have stage five kidney disease. So depending where you are on that spectrum will determine whether or not a specific food is appropriate for your level of kidney disease. Now it is key though to be able to learn to read a food label. And the good news is that the government has made it much easier for us to read food labels over the last year. The things that are important for people with kidney disease are to understand serving size. So I've got a little food label here and you can see that it tells you in bold how much is in that serving size. So for this, a serving size is nine crackers. And then you want to look at sodium. So if you're picking a snack, if you can find something that's less than 200 milligrams of sodium, that will be counted as low sodium. Again, you have to stay in that serving size though. If you have kidney disease, you may also have to look at the protein in a food. And a lot of foods, almost all foods have some protein in them, even these crackers. So that will be listed in the form of grams. You can see it right there on every food label. And then, of course, the topic of the day, potassium, is also required to be listed on all the food labels. These crackers have zero potassium. So it's important to know that those are the things that you're mainly looking at as a person with kidney disease and understanding how those specific limitations fit into your diet. The one thing that's not listed on the food label that people with kidney disease often have to follow is the phosphorus. And so the key to looking at phosphorus in a food label is to read the fine print. And in the ingredients, look for anything that has the letters P-H-O-S. So in these crackers, no phosphorus listed on the food label, but there is monocalcium phosphate listed in the ingredients, meaning that there is some inorganic phosphorus that is likely to be highly absorbable in these crackers. Sandy from Missouri asks, what is leaching potatoes and can you show me how to do it? And yes, Sandy, I can. Leaching potatoes is a process by which we take a potato, everybody's favorite food or a lot of people's favorite food, and leach out the potassium, meaning we'll take the potato, which is full of potassium, and we'll get rid of a lot of the potassium that is inside that potato so you can eat it. Uh, and not worry about having a really high potassium food. The keys to leaching potatoes are first to cut them up into cubes or slices. So the smaller the cubes, the easier that potassium will leach out. So we're going to cut these into cubes. And then we're going to put them in boiling water and let them boil for about 10 minutes. That will get rid of a lot of the potassium and bring it into the water. Then we drain them and we can cook them with much less potassium than they had before. Thank you all so much for watching. It was an honor to partner with the American Association of Kidney Patients. I'm Dr. Blake, the Cooking Doc. I'm also the author of the book, The Cooking Doc's Kidney Healthy Cooking, a modern 10-step guide to preventing and managing kidney disease. Make sure you check out Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you can learn more about May 1st and the National High Potassium Awareness Day and the Are You OK campaign. You can find out more on social media at Are You OK 5.1. Happy cooking, everybody. Learn about potassium in your diet. It really will allow you to eat the foods that you love and make sure you're doing that safely for your level of kidney disease and keeping your heart protected. A big thank you to The Cooking Doc. We so appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with us. If we weren't able to address a question you have, please feel free to email us at info at 
I would now like to turn the remainder of today's program over to AAKP's National Board of Director and Ambassador, Mr. David Rodriguez. David is a former hemodialysis patient and current kidney and liver transplant recipient. Better known throughout the kidney community as Super Dave, he is also a bona fide home chef who inspires his social media followers with his home cooked kidney friendly dishes. We are honored to have David join us to share some patient to patient advice and tips in, on keeping it kidney friendly in the kitchen. And David will also be providing us with a sneak peek of three all new AAKP delicious recipes from our sixth edition. Thank you, David, for joining us, and thank you for welcoming us into your kitchen. Thank you, Diana, and welcome, everyone, to Casa de Super Dave. It is so great to be here to celebrate National High Potassium Awareness Day with AAKP. And everyone watching at home, thank you for tuning in and for caring about this important topic. I was honored to be invited by AAKP to test some of their AAKP delicious recipes from the new 6th edition, and I'm inviting you into my home to check out a few I prepared. First up is a zesty chickpea stew, prepared as is. This is a vegetarian recipe, dietary, protein can come from plants or animals, and each offers different health benefits. The amount of protein you need as a kidney patient depends on your kidney function, and it's important to work with your healthcare team and a renal dietitian to find the right balance. This recipe uses chickpeas as a plant protein source. Legumes or beans are a great source of protein, but it also contain some potassium. Consuming the right portion size, coupled with the correct preparation and cooking method can help lower the potassium content of beans. Consider the following tips when including beans in low potassium diet. Number one, choose to soak or leach beans overnight or approximately 12 hours in a large pot of water. This method can also be applied to potatoes to remove potassium. Number two, after soaking, drain, add fresh water and simmer or boil the beans for at least 30 minutes. If using a pressure cooker, beans should be cooked for at least 15 minutes. Next up is the AKP Delicious Pineapple Beef Stir Fry. You may already know that when following a kidney friendly diet, some common seasonings should be limited. Avoid salt and salt substitutes that replace sodium chloride with potassium chloride when you are following a low potassium diet. But the good news is that you can use plenty of flavorful seasoning without adding unwanted potassium to meals. Fresh herbs are a great choice. Herbs like basil, cilantro, sage, and parsley can be added to dishes to create a variety of flavors. Select fresh herbs over dried herbs for low potassium seasoning. Spices can also enrich the taste and smell of food items. Cinnamon, paprika, turmeric, and ginger add different tastes to meats, vegetables, or other kidney friendly foods. Pepper is a low potassium choice, which comes in several different types, red, black, and white pepper will each add a different kick of flavor to your meal. And if you're looking for more heat and spice, try cayenne pepper. Garlic, whether you use fresh, cooked, or roasted, can enhance the flavor of foods. Mix it with herbs or spices to create more flavors without adding too much potassium. And finally, what a delicious meal without a delicious beverage. You may feel like you're on a tropical island when you try our tropical mocktail. If you like me, you may have questions about what fruits are high in potassium and which are lower in potassium. This recipe includes pineapple and lime, both citrus fruits that are lower in potassium. Other moderate to lower potassium citrus fruits include clementine oranges, lemon, canned mandarin oranges, and tangerines. Some examples of higher potassium citrus fruits include grapefruit, oranges, and pomelo. As a kidney and now liver transplant recipient, cooking kidney friendly didn't always come easy to me. And, that, and as I progressed through my kidney disease, it seemed like my nutritional needs and what was okay and not okay for me to consume was ever changing. A few solid tips that I developed along the way 
and what to share with you are start with the basics and learning about the recipes. Well, I have enjoyed welcoming you into my home and sharing my tips for cooking delicious, kidney-friendly foods. As I always say, our healthcare teams are invaluable, but there's nothing more meaningful than hearing it from a fellow kidney patient. To help us close out today's program and take us down the road of their personal journeys with kidney disease, and to inspire us to be more aware of comorbid conditions many of us kidney patients face, like hyperkalemia, are my fellow AKP ambassadors, Della Major from Chicago, and Jane Demise from New York. Hi, I'm Della Major, and I'm a National Patient Ambassador for AAKP. My name is Jane Demise, and I'm an AAKP Ambassador and a Patient Advocate. One of the interesting things about that disease is it was hard to determine you know, whether or not was this a lupus affecting me or now this new terminology, hypercalcemia. And one of the things that I found out is that they both almost have equivalent symptoms. The cramping, you know, the fatigue, the issues that dealing with the appetites and the eating. And so when we was able to really narrow down that this was some of the issues that I was having, especially with the cramping, because both with the lupus, you know, I had a lot of cramping then. But being a dialysis patient, I realized that with my potassium level numbers was just going out the roof, um, that's something extra that had to be added on. So it affected me mentally, physically, emotionally. And but now, you know, just trying to get it under control, being a post transplant recipient, you know, that has helped a lot, you know, because prior to transplantation, it was functionality was very, very bad. Hyperkalemia or having high potassium has impacted me physically in the sense that I can actually feel when my potassium is up. It impacts me greatly because of my diet. I follow a plant-based diet, which is really tricky because plant-based is always naturally high in potassium. So to try to have to have a balanced diet and have you know enough foods and still watch my potassium along with the, I'm also diabetic, so I have to watch that. There's so many things that are involved in it. And it's just, it just becomes your new normal. You get used to it, but getting used to it was really tricky. Being a dialysis patient, they give us the medication. And I know that that was one of the things for me, it was more changing my diet, uh, the food, you know, eating that I, the food that I ate, because you know, there's certain food bases that's high, high potassium and there's certain bases that's low. And so I had to change my diet. I had to incorporate just a little bit more physical exercise. And then at the time I had to take like a potassium binder. So that was pre-dialysis and post uh, uh, while I was on dialysis. But like I said, since post kidney transplant, uh, the good thing about this is just really watching what I eat, um, you know, doing my labs, checking my levels. And so that's helped a lot. So changing diets, eating properly, eating the foods that's good for me versus the one that's bad. And then, um, you know, the medication at the time. The one thing that I did, and I always recommend this to, to new patients who are learning how to manage a renal diet, is I got a food tracker and I learned to track every single thing that crossed my lips. So you'd be surprised how quickly potassium can add up, especially if you're eating plant-based, because uh, an apple has, you know, potassium in it. And you pop one of those for a snack, you know, meat has potassium, everything has potassium. So you may not realize that something has higher potassium in it until you start looking it up and actually understanding it and then tracking it. I was given a level of 2,000 milligrams per day for potassium, and you would think, well, that's a lot, but it really adds up when you're eating plant-based. Every kidney patient knows that, you know, a chronic kidney diet, diet kidney diet, period, is definitely an individual case per basis. Now you say, how did I learn? I'm still learning. <laughs> I just can't, I'm still learning. Oh my goodness. Cause you know, you know, you enjoy certain foods and you know, I've already had a battle always with low appetite and very poor appetite. And so just to get me to want to eat alone has been that challenge. But when you're dealing with potassium, 
high potassium issues. There's some foods I had to give up that really brought me more pleasure. And so now that pleasure foods, I'm battling with it. But I finally think I got a balance of good and bad. But I cannot sit here and say that I have not given up my pleasure foods. But I'm learning to do things in moderation. And that's what any kidney patient would tell you. We have to learn how to do things in moderation. Because if you tell me to just cut it out completely, you know, like anything, you tell me no, I'm going to say yes. Because, you know, I was like, I'm going to get burnt with the fire, right? But at the same time, I just had to learn to put the right combinations together, you know, do things in moderation, and then learn that way. Um, unfortunately, just recently, and I think it's more medication uh, uh, trend, but I learned that I am dealing with hypoglycemia, which is the diabetes. And so, again, that comes with a healthy eating diet plan exercise and so having all of that i got one thing under control but the other thing came into play so again just being mindful of what i eat what i because you know look you're gonna do it you're gonna eat those foods that's no-nos but if you know what you know if you do it in moderation you will be okay In 2018, I had seen a renal dietitian, and I stressed the fact that she was a renal dietitian. And at that time, she went over, I had kept a food journal prior to seeing her, and we went over my food, and she was looking at it, and first of all, she said something that actually startled me. She said, you're not eating enough calories, and to me, that was like, wow, nobody's ever said that to me before. What I wasn't eating was good calories, so that was one of the first things that she changed for me. Keeping a food tracker helps you itemize everything for a renal diet. I track my sodium, my phosphorus, my potassium. Um, I check my uh, salt levels. I check uh, protein. Protein is extremely important. So um, my um, GFR, my levels, stayed pretty well stable for about three years. But they weren't improving and they really weren't doing much of anything else. And my rest of my blood work was just so-so. I felt okay, but it didn't feel great. So I went back and saw her in 2020, and she said, Jane, try a plant-based to see how that works for you. And I thought, okay, I got nothing to lose. So I really wasn't eat. I haven't eaten red meat since 1986, first of all. So that was not a big change for me. But I do love chicken. Yeah, fish, okay. So getting rid of that protein was not too difficult. What was difficult was getting rid of cheese. Love cheese. But again, dairy um, protein is very hard on the kidneys. So I learned as much as I could about what proteins I could consume and which ones to stay from and just started inducing that into my diet and getting used to it. Like I use almond milk now and almond creamer instead of dairy. And um, it made such a world of difference and I got to brag a little bit here because not only did I bring up my GFR five points, which is never heard of at stage four, I also dropped my cholesterol to a ridiculously low level and my triglycerides. So the plant-based diet is not only good for kidney, it's just good for general health. If you are a dialysis patient, you know that the dietitian, we follow those numbers and those levels very closely. And so I would offer with those who are in center, definitely collaborate and talk with your dietitian because she will be the one that's going to really help you to balance out those potassium levels. She will help you to create a, like a, a diet plan. I used to hate the word diet too because you start thinking about diet, everybody fails on a diet. But when you start thinking about uh, like a healthy food choice or something along that line where it's more natural and then something that you're putting together, when you start working with your dietitian and create that more healthier food choice base for you, then you'll find you have been more uh, compliant with that. That's in center. Now, if you're a transplant patient like myself, you know, a lot of things that was no-nos while you was in dialysis, you sort of kind of get a little bit uh, reprieve a little leeway, but still you want to really talk with your kidney uh, transplant doc, uh, dietitian as well to see how you can make sure that those levels are being balanced. That's one of the things that I definitely had to do is really put together 
a food plan that's going to keep all of those levels really balanced. And so staying within those measures. So I would say for somebody post transplant, you need to make sure that you are paying attention to your labs, making sure you focus on what your potassium levels are, and then try to adjust your diet that's going to help you to keep them in the good side versus on the bad. And so that was one of the things that I had to do, because even though you say you're not restricted like you were in dialysis, you still got to realize a kidney transplant is not a cure. It's a treatment. And like with every treatment, there's a process that you got to go through. So understand your process and then stay within your parameters that you know. So. Plant-based diet has offered an awful lot of benefits for me. I had very high triglycerides. My cholesterol was never really extreme, um, but it wasn't great. It wasn't the best it could possibly be. And I actually have dropped those significantly to the point where everybody was kind of looking at it going, holy crow, that's really a big difference. Um, the other benefits for it is not eating meat is very expensive right now, so I don't have to worry about that. And I, f I feel better. I find a plant-based diet actually keeps me full, keeps me from having hunger pains, which is a lot of people are worried about, oh, I'm never going to feel like I've you know, got enough food. No, that's, that's certainly not an issue. Um, so I just generally feel better, have better energy, and it just makes me overall feel much better. Well, my hefty snack is I like vegetable chips, vegetable, um, uh, veggie, pretty much anything like veggie chips, uh, veggie, uh, plates that has a combination of the greens and the yellows. I am a pepper person. So I like the red peppers, the green peppers, the banana peppers. So I like to put combinations of something that's going to give me color and flavor mm -hmm. color and flavor does it all because you're going to find yourself eat those more healthier uh, items more in consumption than you the bad because why it's hitting that taste bud palace so for me my snack will be the peppers my snack will be like veggie chips, something like that that gives me that's uh, really, really good. I do like certain fruit based like uh, I love caramel apples. So I would have the apple and the peanut butter because that's taking, you know, giving me the omegas, giving me the oil, hitting the beans, but it's not too high. And so when you start doing and making those adjustments, you'll find yourself having those good, the good, better snacks than you have anything else. Yeah. I was very fortunate to incorporate my love of gardening into my renal diet. I actually grow my own herbs. I actually have herbs inside, so I have them year round. And I experiment with herbs. And I love to do a roasted vegetable tray, which I experiment with different flavors, with different herbs. It's amazing how switching from one type of herb, like an oregano, to something I have a spicy oregano, how that really picks up the taste in the vegetables. So it's a lot of fun to not only grow, but I also do a lot of experimenting with um, different kinds of spice blends that I buy. Always very careful to look to see how much salt is in them or sugar. People don't realize they put sugar in spices. Um, I do not use anything like Accent or, or any of those kinds of products because they have other additives that are very dangerous for kidney function. So as natural, 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 natural as I can be, I would rather walk down to my backyard into my garden and actually snip something and cook with that then shake something out of a jar. But, you know, in winter we have some limitations with that. The best tip I can offer to other renal patients is to learn to read labels. People do not realize how much stuff is in processed foods and how harmful they can really be. And I'm not just even talking about salt. I'm talking about all the phosphates and all these other additives that can be in there. And, they, and potassium actually wasn't even regulated until recently. That was not one of the requirements on FDA labels. So the kidney foundations actually were the ones to push that through. So now we do actually have potassium marked on labels. So you should be able to see it. Hopefully soon we'll get phosphate also put on there, hopefully someday. Um, so learn to read labels, stay away from processed foods as much as you can. Uh, even processed meats like sausages or really bacon, whoo, 
not good for you. Keep away from anything that's processed. Go as fresh as you possibly can and make your own foods and, and embrace cooking because you can have an awful lot of fun, fun changing things around and, and making some really delicious meals. And that brings us to the end of today's program. Thank you again for joining us this year's National High Potassium Awareness Day. Our You OK virtual event. And a special thanks again to the guest speakers, our sponsors, Bifar Pharmaceuticals and AstraZeneca. I hope you were able to gain some key insights on why potassium is an important topic for kidney patients and how to effectively manage your potassium level. Although National High Potassium Day is recognized every May 1st, it's an important issue year round. So please continue to visit www.areyouok.org anytime to access educational resources and on-demand content about potassium management in kidney disease. You can also follow us at our UOK 5.1 on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget, download or order your very own copy of AAKP Delicious Kidney Friendly Recipes. From my kitchen to yours, Happy cooking. God bless. All my love. Until next time. So long.